Hey, let's get going. So, uh, we're going to wrap up today uh, with our discussion of various approximation techniques uh, with a area of approximation called online aggregation. Uh, before I get to that, however, uh, once again, today is leaderboard. Um, seriously, if you guys submit anything that works, uh, you will get on here probably. Um, one other thing, uh, project two has been graded. The results should be posted tonight. Um, if someone has a burning desire to contact me by email or by dropping in, in my office or something before the grades are posted, I strongly suggest you follow up on that desire. Uh, but failing that, uh, results will be posted uh, tonight. Okay, uh, so let's, let's get to today's topic. Um, we've been discussing various ways of trading off accuracy uh, for performance. And, well, sketches are one way of doing that. If you want to pre-compute something, uh, do a huge computation over, over lots of data um, that fits in, in memory, uh, you can use a sketch. The, the other approach is that we, we don't use all of the data that's available to us. So we do some sample, uh, we, we pick uh, data at randomly and perform our, our computation uh, based on that particular uh, set of data. Uh, based on, on those samples, we can compute an approximate, uh, we, we can compute a couple of the result tuples that we expect to see. And if the computation that we're looking to, comp uh, to perform uh, is an aggregate, we don't need all of those tuples to get some sort of, of estimate of the result. And so uh, this, this brings us to this idea of online aggregation. We're, we're going to keep generating samples, and as we generate more and more samples, uh, we get a more uh, precise answer. Okay, uh, so loosely speaking, um, we're going to start off by giving the user uh, some immediate results um, by using not the entire data set, but some, some random fraction of the data set. And as we go along, uh, we can have a nice little uh, interface like this that gives the user uh, a running estimate of the average uh, at this particular point in the computation, uh, as well as some information about how accurate that estimate is. So for example, we can tell the user in this case uh, what this, this um, online aggregation interface is, is telling us is that with probability 95%, uh, the correct answer lies somewhere in this particular range. And you can set the confidence bounds, you can set the interval, uh, or you can simply see when the average stops fluctuating. And in each case, uh, the, the computation, the user gets immediate feedback about where the computation is and can stop the computation when they've received a satisfactory answer. So to give you some idea of how this works, we have data sets, we have uh, some query plan, and the basic idea is that we're going to take data values entirely at random and then um, go through the, the query plan as normal and compute values. So for example, if the, the join here uh, produces a tuple with a value 162 uh, that we want to compute, uh, that is in the, the attribute that we want to compute an average of, uh, we can just keep generating uh, more and more, more and more outputs and well, based on two outputs, we can compute that the average is 126, and we can add more and more outputs, and with every additional output that we add, we get a more and more uh, precise result. And so we just keep doing this until we get uh, close to the correct answer. So there are a couple of different uh, problems uh, that, that we have to overcome in order to properly uh, address in order to pro properly evaluate uh, aggregate data in, in this particular way. Uh, the first thing is that in order to get a reasonable estimate of, of really anything, as soon as you start doing sampling, it becomes really critical that you get uh, that the, the values that you sample are truly random. 
because if they're not random, you lose a lot of the nice uh, statistical properties that, that random sampling gets you. Uh, in particular, if, you, if for example, your, your inputs are in sorted order, then you're never going to get a, a really good estimate of the accuracy until you complete the entire uh, scan. Now, there's a couple of, of ways that this can be addressed. Um, the paper, the, the reading for this, uh, for this lecture suggests the use of, of heap files. And if you can sort of uh, assume that the heap file uh, comes in entirely unsorted, or that it's gone through some randomization, then that's pretty much sufficient. Uh, one thing we can do right now, uh, which is not available when the, uh, as of when the, the paper was published, uh, flash drives support much more efficient access to random data, uh, but even then, there's uh, this is not uh, this is this is still a, a fairly open question. The the two main challenges that we are going to address are uh, fairness and blocking. Uh, so let me give you some idea of what each of those are. So if your your query is a, a single aggregate, you get lots of inputs, and each input contributes. Uh, to the accuracy of, of that one uh, output that you're producing. And on the other hand, if you have a group by aggregate, you might have many different results that you're trying to compute. And every input is going to, uh, every, every tuple that gets aggregated uh, is going to contribute to one of these. Uh, and so basically the problem is that, well, let's say you have five different group by keys and a whole bunch of data, all of those uh, data values might lead to a situation where you have one key that is extremely, extremely well represented in the, in the query results. So this uh, group by key three has an extremely accurate uh, answer, and some keys that are completely unrepresented. And so this would probably never, never happen precisely, uh, but in this case, uh, group by key number one doesn't actually have any sort of, of uh, samples at all. Uh, group by key four and five uh, have some samples, but uh, not necessarily particularly precise, enough to get a precise estimate uh, of the aggregate value that's being computed. So what would be the estimate in as well? Uh, it would, you wouldn't have an estimate. In fact, group by, uh, the key, key number one wouldn't even be included in the output. Then it is not an accurate. Hmm? Then it is not an accurate. Well, it's not, uh, it's not accurate that the result is not present. Um, in this particular case, you wouldn't even see group by key one in the output at all. Uh, you wouldn't have any sort of estimate at all. If you expected to see group by key one in the output, um, you wouldn't get anything. Um, and you basically don't have an es a way of estimating group by key one. In either case, it's wrong that it's not even present in the output. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, so to, to put this in a little more uh, context, uh, keep in mind that as the as query processing continues, you get more and more samples. Uh, so this what I what what you're seeing here is a snapshot midway through the computation. So it hasn't completed. Eventually, uh, eventually, if you wait long enough, a sample for group by key one will show up. So basically, the the, the big challenge here is that. The, the distribution of, of uh, tuples that correspond to each of these keys are essentially skewed. Um, you, want to, you want to be able to generate uh, uh, reasonably accurate values and generate them in, in, in sort of a uniform, uh, with uniformly decreasing uh, uncertainty. And so the, the basic solution that uh, take is to, to scan all of these group by keys uh, in parallel. So let's say you have some sort of uh, index on an attribute, and this is the group, uh, the group by attribute. <coughs> so essentially what we're going to do here is we're going to start off with this B plus tree, and we're going to start at the very beginning of the data pages. And then we're just going to say, uh, we're going to assume that the data pages are in some random order. So we're going to start with a completely uh, a complete scan of the entire index. We're going to say, uh, I don't actually care uh, what that attribute is. I'm just going to start at the very beginning. 
And so we're going to get, uh, we're going to start off at the very beginning and we're going to see an attribute key one. And so then we're going to take that scan operator and essentially flip it, uh, switch to uh, replace that, that general constraint on that operator that, or sorry, that, that uh, the constraint on, on that operator, the scan operator starts off with no constraint, and so we're going to replace that, that lack of constraint uh, with the constraint uh, RA equals uh, key one. So because these are sorted on RA, that's uh, something that we can do very easily. At the same time, we're going to add another scan operator. We're going to construct a second scan operator uh, with the, the constraint RA is greater than key one. And so this is going to take us to the first tuple uh, that exceeds uh, K1. We're going to do the same thing there. We're going to replace that uh, constraint with uh, the constraint RA equals K2, the, the second key that we encounter. And we're going to repeat the process. Uh, so we're going to end up with a sequence of scan operators, one scan operator for each group by aggregate. No, sorry, group by term, group by key. Now we're going to, essentially from here, uh, because the, the index is only on um, RA, we can treat every, every one of these scans as essentially being a heap scan. And by uh, splitting the resources, the computational resources available to us, the computational and I.O. resources available to us, uh, between each of these scan operators, uh, we can essentially get progressively more uh, results for each uh, group by key in parallel. Does that make sense? Any questions? Good. All right, so that's, that's the first problem. Okay, well, we've gone through a lot. Okay, uh, so that's the first problem. Uh, the second problem is that in order to get any sort of online uh, results, we need to, in order to get the, the results online, uh, basically as, as soon as they become available, we need to be able to get rid of all of the blocking operations uh, in our query plan. If we have any sort of blocking operation, uh, this, this online process has to wait on that, that blocking operation to complete. So the, the only really absolutely necessary blocking operation in, this, uh, in, in a relation like the query plan is the join. And so basically the solution to this is that we're going to try and find uh, an appropriate non-blocking join. So let's, let's run down our, our list of, of join algorithms. So there's the sort merge join, which is, which is nice. Um, it gives us completely non-blocking uh, performance, assuming that the data is sorted. But the, the problem with this is that we don't want any sort of order on the data. As soon as we have any, any ordering on the data, then the sort of random sampling properties that we're looking for um, go away. So that's, so sort merge, would be ideal, but it's not precisely what we're looking for here. Uh, we can do potentially some sort of index nest and loop join, which is certainly non-blocking on uh, one of the two sides. But the, the problem with that is that if each tuple on the left-hand side, or sorry, each tuple uh, in, in the outer relation uh, matches lots and lots of tuples on the inner relation, then you're basically going to spend the, the randomization, uh, you lose randomization on uh, the, the inner loop of this index nested loop join. So this is not necessarily all that ideal either. And the hybrid hash join has pretty much exactly the same problem. Um, if one of the two tables is small or, or matches very few values, uh, you can possibly get away with blocking on that one table, but again, it's not particularly ideal for the general case. So, um, this, this leads us to a new problem. Um, all of the join algorithms uh, that, that we've discussed so far are either blocking or they're uh, not suitable for our purposes. 
And so the solution that uh, has been proposed is this idea of ripple joints. So let's say you have two different data streams. Data stream one, data stream two. We're going to start off by reading one tuple from each. And then we're going to produce one output. If that output meets the conditions of the join, great. If not, keep going. Then we're basically going to iterate. We're going to iterate along data stream. So we're going to read another tuple from data stream one. And we're going to store that tuple, but we're also going to join it against all of the tuples that we've read so far from data stream two. So we read one tuple, read another tuple, and now we can produce two outputs. Now we're going to do the same thing for data stream two. We're going to read one more tuple from data stream two, and we're going to join it against all of the tuples of data stream one that we've encountered so far. And the process repeats. Read another tuple from data stream one, join it against everything we've encountered from two. Read another tuple from two, join it against everything we've encountered from uh, data stream one. Now one of the nice things about this is that it allows us to use uh, a number of blocking algorithms. Uh, th this general approach allows us to, to use a number of blocking algorithms uh, in, in some interesting ways. In particular, the hybrid hash join, I mean, if you think about it, you can keep, you can treat both of these streams as one of the two hash tables that you're, uh, you can use both of these streams uh, to essentially build your hash tables. So as you're reading from data stream one, you're joining it against the hash table that you built uh, for data stream two, but you're also, join, uh, you're also inserting it into its own hash table uh, for data stream one. And we'll get into that. Actually, we might, give, might even get into that today. Um, but similarly, we can use the same general approach uh, for a tree index. So as we, as we proceed along data stream one, we can build a tree index uh, and use that to satisfy uh, new tuples that arrive on data stream two. Now, if these streams are big enough, eventually we'll have to start resort using uh, resort to using the disk. Uh, so something like block nested loop join, uh, or or actually paging these indices out to disk uh, could also work. Um, any any questions on this? What do you mean by eventually the block nested uh, so, uh, eventually, so keep in mind, uh, consider how, how much space this is taking up at any given point in time. So we're essentially recording every record that uh, came along from data stream one, and we're recording every record that came along from data stream two. Eventually that's going to exceed memory, depending on how big the data is, eventually it could start exceeding memory. And if that happens, then um, we need to start paging out to disk. So something like block nested loop join would help us do that. Any other questions? Okay, well here is uh, at least one question for you. Um, wow. Okay, uh, that's good. We, 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 can, we can move on to uh, new stuff. So um, online aggregation, the, 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 the high level overview of this is that we're, we're trying to compute aggregate results and we can use sampling uh, to get an approximation of those uh, of those results and if we keep sampling uh, we can get progressively more and more accurate uh, results now uh, who here has some sort of statistics background or at the very least has, has worked with any sort of sampling before okay um, so here, here's, here's a bit of a, a question. Um, when, you at, um, <clears throat> when you do sampling, there are two general approaches to sampling. Uh, one of them is analogous to a deck of cards. 
uh, where you have a deck of cards and you deal out uh, the cards, you get back a, uh, it, basically everyone gets a set of, of random cards, uh, but there's no replacement. So no, no two people can have uh, the same ace, for example. Uh, conversely, you can sample with replacement, so you give someone a card, then put the card back into the deck, shuffle the deck. If you give them back, uh, if you give them another card, uh, there's a possibility that they'll get the same card back. Now, when we do the sampling uh, for these, these aggregate queries, there's, we, can do, we can take either approach. So we can, uh, when we, we read a tuple, we can either make it so that we never read that tuple again, or, so, or make it so that we'll uh, eventually make it, well, we don't make it so it's possible, but uh, we, we don't prevent it uh, from being read back ever again. Um, which of those is a better approach? So do we, uh, is there any situation where, where or what, what would the benefit of reading the same, allowing uh, the same tuple to be read over and uh, sampled over and over again? If the data set is large, it will make a difference. Okay, what difference? Like if, the, if there's like one million tuples. Okay, well if there's a million tuples, it would make a difference, but what would that difference be? I agree, it will make a difference, but the question is uh, uh, what kind of difference? Or what, 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 is, the, uh, what is the benefit or, or, uh, or possibly drawback of, of allowing the same tuple to be resampled? If the data set is small, then reading it would affect the result. But if it's large, there might be other samples on the other end, so reading it again would not make a difference. Uh, okay, so if there's a lot of data, then there is a fairly low performance, uh, the, a fairly low accuracy impact of reading the same tuple over again, because you'll uh, it, that mistake will sort of merge itself into the rest of the data. Okay, um, any reason why? So what is I guess then the drawback? of, uh, let's say you do have a huge data set, which is the primary application of this, uh, what would the drawback of the other approach be? What would the drawback be of uh, allowing tuples to be, uh, or preventing tuples uh, from being uh, re resampled? I think we have a lot of the sample with replacement. Each time we first have something, and then we take it back, it will actually it's reflect the true uh, distribution of that data. If we do not allow that sample with replacement, once we get some data and we export it, and the distribution of the data will change. Actually, the, the, well, the, dis the distribution of the output will, will change. Yeah, the original, the original data will change because, you know, if you have some, some data from the data site, and see. then if you export that data, then the distribution of that will change. If it does not, uh, if it's for that we a lot of sample with replacement, the distribution will always be the same. If that is with high probability, then it will, be, it will, be, it will always be the same thing. Okay. Otherwise, pretty good chance. So the, uh, the answer, if I understand correctly, is that the distribution of values you get will remain the same as long as you don't allow replacement. Yes. Or sorry, as long, as, as long as you do allow replacement. If we allow this replacement, it will be the same distribution. That's okay, so change. if if you allow replacement, you'll keep sampling from the same exact distribution. Yes. Um, let me ask you this. I think this so is, then the distribution will be accurate. Okay. This this distribution will be accurate. Okay. Because it's distributing the same. Thing. Okay. So let me let me ask you this. If I allow if I if I don't allow replacement, then eventually I'll get to a point where I've sampled every single tuple. And once I've sampled every single tuple, I will have precisely the correct result. 
characterizing this actually is better if we return the same distribution. Okay, it's it's simpler. Um, That's why we have if we have a data set with 100 bits and we have 22 uh, data in that 100 numbers, which can be for example that 2 and we have 99 bits and then we have 99 or 99, the probability probability will change. If so you think that is simple. Okay, so without getting into a, a huge, uh, okay, without getting into a huge uh, probability uh, lecture, the let me give you, you some intuition um, as to why it's not that's not necessarily the case. Um, let's so if you if you sample one tuple, then you have some amount of error in your result based on that sample. Given that, that sample, you've already in, in introduced some amount of error into the, the result that you've, you've got. Now, if you allow the same sample to occur, it's possible to get that error over again. Now, over the course of many random, excuse me, many random samples, that error will work itself away. But essentially what you're doing by excluding that, that one sample from, from being uh, replaced is the new distribution you, you have it accounts for that initial error that, that the first sample gave you. So it's the distribution minus that error. Um, so for, uh, from a, in terms of time until convergence, sampling with replacement will give you a, a more accurate results. It's now one thing you hit on there was that it's simpler. Sampling with replacement is simpler. Um, can someone give an intuition of why? Uh, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Okay. Let me rephrase that slightly. Uh, you don't have to. So, if you if you sample without replacement, you need to keep track of which tuples you've you've kept track of. And this is uh, where where you're where I was trying to uh, go with your comment. Um, the you have to keep track of every single tuple that you've removed. So now you're you're basically. Uh, that's going to take an amount of space that is proportional to the size of the data set. And if the data set is really, really big, then you don't want to keep track of every single tuple that you've, uh, you've potentially sampled. OK, well, um, essentially, uh, this, this is still a pretty open challenge. Um, data is big. There, uh, this is this is important, and it's pretty much still a problem because any sort of random access is, is still going to be super expensive. Uh, transferring data around is going to be super expensive, and uh, one of the, the sort of really really uh, challenging open challenges in online aggregation is the fact that as you're getting more and more precise results, the data that you're querying is changing. Uh, is changing under you. Um, so the, the, the actual computation, there's no correct answer at any given point in time. Uh, so essentially the, the, the challenge is then to uh, sort of keep up with the data that's, the data that you're querying. Um, okay, let's see, so we've got 20 minutes. So uh, yes. what is the sample query for an organization? Sorry? Could you give us a sample query for online aggregation? Uh, you can, so it's essentially any any query, um, but uh, select average r dot a from r. That is an that is a perfectly reasonable example. Uh, select average of r dot a from uh, r natural join s. But uh, if the data is in that 
you won't be able to get a precise result immediately, uh, but you'll be able to get an approximate result that will, as the underlying data changes, there, there is some correct result at any given point in time. And uh, what you can do is sort of uh, converge towards that approximate result. So if, if at some point in time the average is uh, 2.7, uh, over time this, this interval is going to shift towards 2.7. And if that result shifts down to 2.55, then this, this interval will start moving down. Does that make sense? Yes, sir. sir but uh, there would be uh, there a need of uh, approximate answer for an aggregate. Uh, when do we need an approximate answer for an aggregate? Uh, so, OK, uh, I see. So let's say you're, um, you're Google and you want to know how many times a particular page has been visited. Or how many uh, times, how many times a uh, pages that fall into the shopping category have been visited. Now this is a huge, huge aggregate query. They'll, in practical terms, they'll probably pre-compute things. Um, but if you want to just on the fly get this information out, then this is essentially a joint query. So you have to figure out which category each site falls into, and then you want to um, find all of the, the uh, tuples that match that particular category, and you have this huge chunk of data, this huge click log that'll track information for every site, but there are gonna be a huge amount of sites, and each, just getting all of that data together is going to be very expensive. Um, perhaps a little more, more practical application would be, uh, would be something like, uh, in Wal uh, let's say you're, you're a large manufacturer, um, and this is kind of where the TPCH benchmark came from. So you're a large manufacturer and you have an analyst sitting there looking at this huge huge warehouse of data, gigabytes or even petabytes of data. And this analyst wants to be able to very quickly ask uh, just completely random out of the blue questions like, uh, how would our profits change when we uh, give a discount to, uh, to customers in the US who have ordered three blue sprockets from us in the past? Now, that's a fairly complex query, and in general, if you're talking about petabytes of data, that's going to take a while to run. On the other hand, you don't necessarily need a precise result uh, as the output of that. Um, if you're looking for just a general sense of whether you should give, uh, provide this, this sort of discount to, um, if you're just looking for a general sense of, of what would the, the impact of this particular marketing promotion be, uh, then all you need is an approximate answer. You, I mean, you can leave the thing to, to run for, for a couple of days, but if it's, uh, if it's going to cost you uh, more than you're willing, more than you expect to make, then you can immediately just uh, switch to a different promotion, to, to a different strata. Ask a completely different question. Does that sort of give you a, a sense? I mean, the, the idea is to basically support these, these are random, random questions that you can't really predict with a good index or pre-materialized data structure, like uh, uh, pre-materialized data structure. So, um, like a data cube, which we've talked about. Um, and yeah, the, the queries are going to take time. Um, to give you some sense, uh, there's a group of analysts that I worked with at one point at uh, Microsoft Azure, and they run queries. Um, I mean, they have huge amounts of statistics from their, their cloud, their production clouds, and they'll run, they'll run queries that take days. Like, they, uh, it's, it's not unlikely for them to, to just uh, start a query up and, and come back two days later and, and get a result. Having this sort of facility makes it possible to get immediate feedback as to whether or not that query result is converging to something that you'd like. And if it isn't, then you can stop it immediately and, and just 
give up. And once it converges to some point that you're satisfied with, maybe you don't even need it to compute, uh, let's say, nine, if 5% of the data is sufficient to compute a reasonable estimate, then 5% of the data is all you need to ever use. Okay. Um, all right, well, um, why don't I start with sort of a very brief intuition um, about the next topic. Can use that, do that with this wonderful diagram here. So, um, one last bit of analytics that we're going to talk about is this idea of stream processing. And so streams are essentially, from a database perspective, a stream is essentially a, uh, a relation. It works exactly like a relation. It has attributes, uh, it has uh, tuple, it, tuples arrive on that stream. Uh, the only difference is that a relation has a fixed amount of data in it, whereas a stream just keeps coming. So think of uh, Twitter, for example. Each Twitter, uh, each tweet has uh, a block of text, which has, is a very nice Avericar 140. Um, it has a sender. It has a set of hashtags or, or pointers to that hashtag. Um, and it has potentially other metadata like uh, URL references and image references and so forth. Now, if we have a query plan, now we want to be able to query these streams in the same way that we query uh, regular data. So we want to be able to specify a SQL query that gives us some sort of, uh, that allows us to do some sort of computations on the output of one of these, these uh, streams. And so the, uh, the basic idea there is that the data is coming in just like this. It's coming in uh, one tuple at a time, and we want to be able to very, effect, uh, very quickly respond, react uh, to, to the output of, of that stream, and produce new results. Because the uh, and because the stream never actually finishes, it never actually ends, there's at least there's no end in, of, of tweets in sight, uh, we need to be able to, to produce outputs without blocking the system. And so what we're going to talk about in the next lecture uh, is what's known as a, uh, a, a semi-join. I want to say semi-join. Uh, basically a, for, uh, a variant of, of join processing where you're going to use a blocking algorithm, but rather than uh, blocking both sides of the computation, uh, you're going to essentially build an index on one of the two, or sorry, for each data stream, you're going to build one index, and every time a new tuple arrives, you're both going to insert it into its local index, as well as join it against the index that you've already built uh, for the other stream. And so this allows us to do something very much like this ripple join, uh, where every single time we get a new tuple on one of the streams, we can immediately join it against tuples in the other stream. Now, of course, this is going to uh, very rap as as we mentioned, this is going to very rapidly uh, exceed the amount of memory that we have available. Uh, so we're going to have to use things like windows. Uh, we talked about those a couple lectures ago uh, to restrict how many tuples appear in either of these. Now that brings us to another challenge because the there's, every time we get a new tuple, uh, there's going to be some cost associated with processing that tuple. And so the cost is going to affect both, uh, is going to be both based on the, uh, if we get a new tuple from data stream one, uh, we have to do three separate things. We have to be able to uh, join it against data stream two, and that's going to have some cost associated with it. We have to insert that tuple into the index we're building for data stream one, uh, but then we also have to be able to remove uh, any tuples and any results uh, that we've produced uh, based on uh, based on things that have just fallen out of the window. So uh, that's going to be 
somewhat nifty. Um, with that, I guess we're going to end a little bit uh, early today. So. Cheers. Any questions, by the way? All right.